All right, guys, so here's your helpful hint video for this week's FRQs. Um, number 2005, 6A and C, here's our differential equation. Remember, that's just a derivative, which means it's something that can tell us some slopes. So as on the axis provided, sketch a slope field for the given differential equations at the 12 points indicated. I'll do one point, you guys can do the rest. So let's say I choose this point. The coordinates of that point are negative 1, 2. That means that x is negative 1 and y is 2. So the slope at that point, if I plug in those values of x and y, would simplify to be 1. And so it's a positive slope, so I know it would go upwards. And a slope of 1 is about a 45 degree angle to the horizontal. Um, all that really matters, though, is that any slopes that come after that one, if they're bigger than 1, then they should be steeper. If they're less than 1, like a fraction, like 1 half, they should be flatter. And if they're negative, then they should be sloping down the other way. Hey, what's going on, Brian? Um, so, all right. So I'll let you guys do the rest. Um, as for part C here, um, hopefully you guys kind of know how to do that already. We've done a lot of those, but I'll just say, look at your 2.2 notes if you're a little bit clueless. Um, but basically, you just integrate. You got to separate your variables. Get the y's on one side, x's on the other. And whenever you get your C in there, don't forget your plus C, right? You solve for C using your initial condition. So that's old stuff. Honestly, this, this question, there's nothing um, too horribly challenging about that one. It's pretty straightforward, pretty basic. Did tons of problems like that in class. Just a great opportunity to review some key stuff. All right, now this next one is a little bit challenging. There's a couple of concepts that we need to make sure we remember. And they're concepts that are a little bit difficult to remember. Um, so first of all, let's take a look at the question. It says g with a little negative 1. That means inverse. So if g inverse is the inverse of g, write an equation for the line that's tangent to the graph of this at x equals 2. So first of all, you guys got to remember, how do you find a tangent line? First of all, you need an x value, which they graciously provide you with. The next thing you need is a y value. You get that by plugging it into the original function. And then you need a slope, which is your derivative of your original function. So that's how you find a tangent line. Now, we already know the x value for this one's 2, so that's easy enough. But you guys are going to have a hard time probably finding y and maybe even a harder time finding the derivative. So let us let me review a few key concepts. I'm not going to tell you the answer. I want you guys to think about it a little bit more, but you can always look up the video if you want to get the answer revealed to you. But here's how inverses work, you guys. If I have g of a equals b, then the inverse of g would look like this. The input becomes the output, and the output becomes the input. So, for instance, on our table up here, what is g of 2? g of 2 is 3. In this case, this plays the role of an x value, and this plays the role of a y value. So I would look for 2 in the x column, and I'd go over to the g column, and there it is. It's 3. Okay? But what if I said, what's g inverse? Well, they're switched, right? But if I do that, that means we're actually going to start in the y column and go to the x after that to get the answer. So you would start in the g column to 3 and work your way backwards because it's an inverse. So here's another quick one. Let's say I had this g inverse of 6. What would that be? Well, it's an inverse. You start in the g column, you go down to 6, and you move over to the left, and the answer is 4. That's how you're going to find the y value for the g inverse function. So remember, with your tangent line, you need an x value, you need a y value. That's how you're going to find your y value. Now, how the heck are you going to find your slope? Well, a little while ago, I gave you guys a formula for the slope of an inverse function. If you have an inverse function, the slope, aka the derivative, at any point b, is equal to 1 over g prime, not g inverse, but g prime, of g inverse of b. Okay, so for instance, if I wanted to find the slope of g inverse at, let's say, 
um, we'll say mm, two. No, I don't want to do two because that's the one that's actually on the test. Let's say I want to find g inverse of four, right? So it's going to be one over g prime of g inverse of four, right? And so what I would do is I would first of all need to figure out what is g inverse of four. So I go to the g column, I look for four, and then I go to the left and I find out that's three. So this is going to be one over g prime of three. And now this is a regular g, right? It's not an inverse. So now we're back to starting in the x column. So I'm going to start in the x column for three. And then I'm going to go over where it says g prime, because this is a prime, not a regular g. And the answer is two. So I end up with a slope of one half. So that's how you do that. So which, this is a flashcard. You know, I've printed flashcards for you guys, and um, I hope you guys are using those, because this is one of those little things. You will see that on the test at some point on your AP exam, and it's never used very often, so it's totally easy to forget. But if you just put it on a flashcard, hit it up maybe once or twice a month, uh, it won't blow you totally out of the water when you get there. Okay, So you want to keep fresh on that. Anyway. So we know how to find the tangent line, and now we know how to find each piece needed to find the tangent line. We're going to go ahead and move on now to the next one here. Um, all right. So so as I was looking at this question, I realized I'd left something out of it, so I went ahead and added what was needed in there. It was this sentence, and I went ahead and uploaded that differently as well in the worksheet. So there we go. Now we're complete. So it says, let g be a function defined like this. So g is a piecewise function. So g is equal to f of x, which is this, for any values of x that go from negative 5 to negative 3. And after that, from negative 3 and up to positive 5, it changes to this function. So there's our piecewise function. And the, the question is, is it continuous at x equals negative 3? Well, remember, first of all, to show that something is continuous, you have to show that it exists. So you have to find what is g of negative 3. Does it exist? Okay. Um, since we're plugging in negative 3, you would use the top function. So you're plugging negative 3 into f of x, which is this function. And I'll leave you with that. The next thing you need to do is you want to prove that the limit exists. What is the limit of g of x as x approaches negative 3? Okay, now with piecewise functions, if you're trying to find the limit of a piecewise function at one of the boundary points, in other words, the function g of x consists of two pieces, and it switches from f of x to x plus 7, at x equals negative 3. So we call that a boundary point. So with a piecewise function, you know, let's say f of x looks like this, x plus 7 looks like this. The question is, do they connect or not? If they don't connect, it's not continuous. And the way you can tell if they connect is if the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right. If they are the same, then that means they meet up at a point, and, it's con and at least the limit exists, right? Um, so Basically, then, what you need to do is you need to find the limit from the left, and then you need to repeat that process and find the limit from the right. And if all three of these things are the same, then it's continuous. Because if these two are continuous, then the limit exists, and that means that the limit is that value. And then if these two match this, that means it's continuous because for a function to be continuous, the function would have to be equal to the limit as x approaches that value on both sides. And so this will end up being your final statement in the problem, but you still need to fill in these question marks, find out what they are. You're going to do this very similar thing here on part, the last question here. It's the same question. I have a couple of these. Um, I've seen about three or four um, FRQ questions that are asked like this. So this is a great question to practice. Um, so I'll leave that with you guys and 